Yes, here we are. It's Monday, July 1, 2024. And um, Anika, please introduce yourself and tell us about your work and please tell us a story. Thank you so much, Eric, for this opportunity yet again. It's always a pleasure uh, to share stories on your forum. Uh, I'm Anagha Prasad. I'm from Bangalore, India. I've been telling stories for the last 10 years, and it's been a wonderful journey um, growing with every telling that I do, healing from within. And uh, I think pandemic opened up me telling stories for adults. Um, been doing a lot of workshops for the kids and adults and totally enjoying and growing with it. Today, I'm gonna share uh, A Woman on the Platform 8 by Ruskin Bond. Um, so let's get into the story. Cool. This was the scene in the Ambala station. And there was this small little boy all of 12 years, sitting all alone. He reached the station at three. This was his second year to the boarding school and he had traveled all alone. Fourth, he was a big boy now. Till six, he tried to entertain himself to the extent that he could. He fed biscuits to the stray dog. <laughs> That's how he called them. He waited for every train to come and his play was he would go stand right in front of the door and when everybody got out, he would be pushed out of the station with all the people rushing in. And then he would wait and look and spot his suitcase and say, yes, this is there. He did this for three, four hours and then he got bored. He plonked himself on the suitcase and looked around. <sighs> I still have six hours to go, is what he thought. Are you alone, my dear son? He heard a voice. He looked up and there was this woman clad in a white sari with deep, dark eyes. I'm going to school. Of course, I'm sure you are and you're capable of going alone. The moment the woman said that, he instantly started having a liking for her. Yeah, I've been waiting for quite some time. Of course, I've been seeing you and observing you. How long is it till your train comes? It comes only by midnight, 12 o'clock. What's your name? Um, should he say? Should he not say? He remembered his parents saying, don't talk to strangers. But he couldn't stop himself and looked at her and said, Arun, welcome. Still a long way to go. Let's have something to eat. And before he could say no, and with his suspicious eyes, he looked at her, but she grabbed his hand and started dragging him towards the dining room. Not dragging exactly. He kind of kept pace. And she looked back and said, hey, Porter, look after the boys suitcase. They reached the dining room, sat on a table. She ordered tea, some chips, samosas and dosas. Looking at the food and the hot tea, Arun's heart thawed. He started talking to her. A lonely boy having food there, I think just melted him. Started telling about his school, his friends. She was more a listener throwing in questions here and there. She never asked him from where he came or who his parents were and about his life. Neither did he ask her any of those questions. He just accepted her the way she was. A woman who brought, bought him some sweets and some food when he was all alone in that station. They spent around 45 minutes to one hour and as they walked back to platform eight, 
they saw that the engine was just passing in. Just as it passed, there was a small little boy who jumped onto the track and ran across. This woman held Arun's hand very tightly. Her nails digging into his and her grip becoming very, very tight. She kept looking and as that other boy crossed the platform safely, she released the grip on Arun's hand. He looked at her and said, he's safe. Don't worry. Hey, Arun, how are you? The boy looked and it was Satish, his friend, who was boarding the train right there. Satish had come with his mother and his mother came and said, ah, such a big ordeal, isn't it? Waiting till 12 o'clock in the night to make these kids board and we can't send them alone as well. Big bad world. You must be Arun's mother. She said, looking at that woman. Arun was about to explain and that woman said, yes, I am Arun's mother. Arun looked puzzled at her but didn't say anything. Arun, you should be very, very careful. Don't leave your mother's hand. You don't know how strangers are. Big bad station and you all alone. And the woman in the white sari said, well, he is capable of traveling alone and looking after himself. Arun immediately forgave her for telling a lie. And his liking for her just multiplied. But be careful, okay? Said Sarish's mother. Auntie, I like strangers. Oh, for these kids? They don't understand what we are trying to say. You like strangers? You will know only when you get into deep trouble. Look at him. What he is saying? Said Satish's mother. The, the lady in the white sari just had a smile. Satish was tugging um, his mother's sari and looking at Arun. Ah, ah, somebody is there to argue with my mother was the expression on Satish's face. Arun caught that expression and thought, <laughs> not bad, he's on my side. And just as this conversation between the eyes of the boys was going on, the train which they were supposed to board just started entering. Satish left his mom's sari and ran. And even before this train could stop, he jumped into one of the uh, compartments and said, Hey, Arun, this compartment is empty. Come, 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 come. Let's sit. They hadn't booked tickets. They were traveling in an unreserved compartment where they had to just board and just sit wherever the place got. Sat Arun went in. Satish and Arun went and got placed right near the window pane. They sat opposite to each other and their mothers, hmm, no, Satish's mother there and the other woman standing right next to them. Satish's mother was ranting, be careful, don't do that, don't do this. It was only full of don'ts and none of the do's. And then she gave him a big packet filled with candies and chocolates and fruits and said, share with him, poor little boy. Arun, anger was seething. Oh, she thinks I'm very poor. And also this mother of mine looks very poor. She's so simply clad. But he looked at Satish's mother and he said, I should just drag this a little more. And he held the hand of the woman with the white sari. He looked into her eyes. She looked into his. Neither of them spoke anything. And as the train was about to start when the guard blew a whistle. He just peeped out, planted a kiss on her cheek. <laughs> Said Satish, for he was very happy that he was going away from him, from her. 
He said, Bye, Satish. Be careful. Arun just looked at that woman. Didn't wave. Didn't say anything. Just said, Goodbye, Mother. And kept looking at her. Satish's mom started talking to that woman in the white sari, but she did not pay any attention for she was only looking at Arun through that window. Arun kept looking at her till the train just disappeared from the station. The woman in the white sari just left the station with a smile on her face. Thank you so much. And that's my story for today. Thank you very much. So what really attracted you to that story? Um, I was expecting the suspense of the stranger might do something to him, something to him. And then uh, how we all think that in this bad world, we shouldn't talk to strangers, but it are, it's these small little things which brings hope to all of us that the world is so beautiful and how we carry on hope within us so it really drew that I mean that was something that really touched my heart and when she said she's the mother uh, a lot of stories just popped into my head and uh, it was beautiful to see Arun also accepting her because she showed that motherly love towards her mm -hmm. so yeah I think hope is what drew me to the story hmm. Anybody, any thoughts? Well, Ananga, I would just say in your telling, I love how you bring joy and hope to the telling of the story. You, so um, you know, you're, 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 you're just so bright. Your smile is so big and, and it kind of exudes everything in the story. Thank you so much, Barry. It Thank you. It means a lot. Thank you. Beverly? I, 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 well, I was attracted to your face and your facial expressions, like he said, and the tone of your voice, it just all blended together. You just look beautiful on screen telling your story. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great story. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, Moira, I saw you nodding your head. You agreed with something? Or you... Were you nodding or just moving? Uh, your, your mic is not turned on. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. So it's just the, the earphones. Yeah, uh, actually, I can only agree to what has already been said. It, it's just such a pleasure to watch you, Anaga. And it's like you're feeling with the little boy. It's, it's sort of you, you're one with the story and with the kids. And it's it's very charming. And there's, uh, there's all that little tension. And is so uh, what about this, the secret of this woman? There, there's an underlying trust, which is very beautiful. Confidence, everything will be right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Vicky? Oh, Vicky, it must be three in the morning for you. <laughs> Well, I think Barry is on the West Coast, too. So it's dark out there. Oh, oh it's getting light. So anyway, <laughs> uh, I loved the way you told the story. It felt like it, I was seeing it through a child's eyes. Oh, thank you so much. You told it with such, there was such innocence in it. And it was a mystery, but it was a gentle mystery. So I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Vicky. means a lot. Thank you. What is Ruskin Bond really known for? I mean, is there a particular style of story that he tells? Uh, he His stories are, a lot of his stories are for children. Mm -hmm. And um, most of the stories are, the setting is, is in the hills. So he's from Darjeeling. Mm. So from the uh, hills of Himalayas and the other places. And um, it's beautiful how he blends the countryside, the... Um, the culture and he brings out a lot of emotions which are so pure to the children um, and very few uh, stories for the adults too he's written but for children it is beautiful 
Hmm. Good. All right. Well, does anyone have any other thoughts uh, about the story? Any comments, questions? <coughs> I think Deepa wanted to say something. Oh, Deepa, go ahead. Yes. So, Anaka, I've always been a fan. <laughs> Thank Today you. also it was like your expressions. I was like waiting for each and every moment as it unfolded in yeah. front of my eyes. I could visualize the train and how her, uh, the uh, lady in the white sari, how tightly she was holding Arun's hand. So everything that imagery that you create is like wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Anika. Thank you, Eddie. We'll, we'll proceed on. Yes. Okay. So our next storyteller is Renu Narayan here in Chennai. And um, Renu, please introduce yourself and tell us about your work and, and tell us the title of the story. And then please tell us a story. Yes. Thank you, Eric. I am Renu Narayan. I am from Chennai. I have a storytelling endeavor called Kata Vriksh. I also have monthly uh, storytelling events online as well as offline. I invite uh, about four tellers every month. We just finished one last night. And um, my passion is storytelling and of course training. And today I'm going to share the story of Baba Yaga and Vasilisa, which actually I have to thank Eric because I heard the story when I did the a session, a workshop with Eric and his wife, Magdalene. And I absolutely loved that perspective that Baba Yaga is not evil. She's actually a very strong woman. And that's somehow attracted me to the story. And I still stick with that. So here the here's the story. Uh, be before you begin, is there any way you can stabilize your, your camera so it doesn't move? I'm, I'm on my phone, Eric. That's, a, that's the problem. Can that's you put it on a pile of books or anything? Anything, a desk? I don't have anything right now. No, no, I'm not at home. That's the problem. Anyway, oh, let me just okay, try the best to tell yeah, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. A long time ago, in a small town in Russia, there lived a young girl called Vasilisa. Vasilisa was the only daughter of a rich merchant and a homemaker. Vasilisa's father went away for long trips abroad. And Vasilisa therefore became very close to her mother. Unfortunately for Vasilisa, when she was just about 12 years old, her mother felt very sick and was in her bed. One day she called Vasilisa and said, My dear Vasilisa, I don't think I'm going to last much longer. I have a gift for you. Here, keep this doll with you. She'll take care of you when I'm no, no more. Vasilisa was heartbroken. But there was nothing she could do. A few days later, her mother passed away. Vasilisa found great comfort in the doll. The doll was magical. She spoke to Vasilisa and comforted her whenever she was at. After a couple of years, her father decided to marry again. He married a woman who already had two daughters. Vasilisa was excited and thrilled. She was happy to welcome a new mother and two sisters. She loved company. But unfortunately for her, her stepmother and stepsisters didn't take to her at all. They didn't like her vivacious good looks. They didn't like the fact that she was so affectionate and kind. They disregarded her. Whenever her father was not around, her mother would give her all the difficult tasks to do around the house. And she would send her out to do work outside the house as well, especially during the thick of winter or the harshest of summers, hoping that her skin would spoil and she would become ugly. But she didn't know the secret. She didn't know that Vasilisa's doll was magical. That every time Vasilisa fed the doll something, the doll would do all the work for her. And therefore Vasilisa thrived. And the stepmother was shocked and couldn't understand why Vasilisa's skin was not breaking or why she was looking as beautiful and as enchanting as ever. After a few years, the merchant passed away and now Vasilisa's time had come to be really, really treated badly by her stepmother. They had grown up, and now the stepmother wanted Vasilisa out of the way. 
one night when all of them were sitting down, Vasilisa's well, stepmother went around and switched them, just putting out all the candles in the house. Finally, there was only one candle left and it was almost gone out. When it had gone out, she said, I want one of you girls to go across to Baba Yaga's house and get a light. Now, Baba Yaga was famous. She was, an, she was considered to be an evil witch. She lived in a house which stood on chicken legs. Everybody had heard stories about her, that Baba Yaga ate human beings like others ate chicken. Vasilisa was terrified of Baba Yaga. And Vasilisa's stepmother knew it. She turned to her oldest daughter and said, why don't you go to Baba Yaga's house and get some light for us? The older daughter looked at her and said, Mama, I'm only knitting and I can see my needles well enough. I don't need light. She turned to her second daughter and her daughter said the same thing. Mama, I'm only doing knitting and I don't need light. So now the stepmother was happy. But Silisa, you will go to Baba Yaga's house and you will fetch a light for us. But Silisa could not argue with her stepmother. And so with a heavy heart, she set out of the house. Her only comfort was a doll which she had hid inside her pocket. She put her hand in and felt the doll. And somehow that comforted her. She walked along. It was dark and she was scared. But as she was walking, she saw a horseman clad all in white, riding a white horse, galloping by. And as he went by, the first rays of dawn started to appear and lit up the way for Vasilisa. She continued to walk towards the forest. And as she neared the forest, a man dressed all in red, riding a red horse, galloped by. And just then the sun came up, bright up above in the sky. Now Vasilisa was no longer scared. She continued to walk. She walked and she walked and she walked till she reached Baba Yaga's house. And sure enough, Baba Yaga's house was terrifying to look at. The fence was made of human bones. And on the fence, the posts were made of skulls, eyes glowing red. Vasilisa was scared even to go near the gate. And just as she hesitated, a man dressed all in black, riding a black horse, went galloping by, past, went past the gate into the galloped away. Vasilisa stood there wondering what was happening. And darkness had fallen. Just then there was a terrible crash. And down came something crashing down. It was Baba Yaga in her mortal and with a pestle. Who is that there? She shouted. Then she looked at Vasilisa. What are you doing here? You have no right to be here, she said. I, I have come to fetch light. My stepmother has sent me, said Vasilisa. Hmm. I know all about your stepmother. Come inside, she said. And Vasilisa followed her into the house. <coughs> Baba Yaga went crashing in and said, Well, I love to eat human beings, but I shall see for a day what you can do, my girl. Come in, go into the kitchen and fetch me my food. So Vasilisa went into the kitchen and she saw that there was a huge oven full of food, fit enough to feed an army. She brought the food to Baba Yaga and Baba Yaga just ate it like there was no tomorrow. When she was replete with food, she thrust a stale slice of bread into Vasilisa's hand and then fell down flat onto her back, the sharp nose almost hitting the ceiling. And soon she was fast asleep, snoring away. <laughs> Vasilisa just curled herself in a corner, held on to her doll and went to sleep. The next morning when she woke up, Baba Yaga was already up. You girl, I'm going to set you a whole lot of tasks. And if you don't finish them, you, I shall have you for my dinner tonight, she said. Clean the whole house, sweep it, mop it, go outside. There's a whole lot of meat outside. Clean it, finish all the work. If you don't, I shall eat a spinner, she said. Crash, she left. Vasilisa was terrified. How can I do the work? What do I do? She said, no. And I all said, don't worry about it. I'll be here with you. I'll do everything. All you need to do is to go and cook. 
And so Vasilisa went out, went to the kitchen and started to cook. And the little doll, she swept, she mopped, she cleaned all the wheat. All the tasks were completed. And that evening, when Baba Yaka came back, crashing again in her motor. To a surprise, all the tasks had been done. Bring me my food, she said. Vasilisa brought her some delicious food that she had cooked. Baba Yaga relished it, thrust another slice of stale bread into Vasilisa's hand and went to sleep. Now what I haven't told you till now is that when her mother passed away, before she passed away, when she gave the doll to Vasilisa, she had told her, remember one thing, Vasilisa, whenever you want the doll to help you, please feed her first. And so Vasilisa always kept that stale bread for her doll and she would feed her in the morning as soon as she woke up. The second day too, Baba Yaga had set her a whole lot of tasks to do. But once again, her doll did all the work for her. And Baba Yaga could find no complaint. That evening, when she came back and she had a dinner, she said, would you like to ask me any questions, girl? And Vasilisa thought for a minute and said, yes, I have three questions for you. Well, there better be good questions, said Baba Yaga. Vasilisa said, when I was coming here, I saw a white horse ridden by a white man, a man dressed all in white. What does that mean? Oh, that's the break of dawn. Anything else? Yes, I saw a man riding a red horse dressed all in red. That's my midday. And when I came here, I saw a man dressed all in black. When I came by on a black horse, that's my night, Maria. Now, I have one question for you. Tell me, how did you do all that? There must be a secret. That was my mother's blessing. Blessing? Blessing? That's no, no, no blessing. Wow, yep, she was angry. I think it's time you went home, girl. Come outside with me. And the two of them went outside. And Baba Yaga took out one of the skulls, took a stick, stuck the skull on the stick. And handed it to Vasilisa. Okay, said Vasilisa. And Baba Yaga went back to Vasilisa. She said, How for my food? Don't throw it away, Vasilisa. Give it to your stepmother. That's what Baba Yaga wants. And so Vasilisa went ahead to the house, the skull lighting up the way for her. And she reached home, it was still very dark till night. She knocked on the door and her stepmother came and opened it. The moment she saw this girl, she ran away screaming. But suddenly, to Vasilisa, surprised, jumped off the stick. She is her stepmother. Before Vasilisa knew it, her stepmother and her two stepsisters were burned to ashes. Vasilisa didn't want to live in that house anymore. And so, holding on to her doll, she started to walk towards the nearest town. And when she reached the town, it was almost morning. She knocked on the first cottage she came to. The cottage was opened by an elderly woman. What is it, child? She asked. By now, Vasilisa was grown up, and she was a really charming young woman. I want shelter, mother. I'm tired. I want to rest. Come in, come in, said the old woman. And Vasilisa went in. The old woman kindly gave her something to eat. And Vasilisa was the first time in life. Comforted. The next morning, Vasilisa woke up and she chatted with the wheel. The two of them continued to live together. One day, Vasilisa said to the old lady, I think with you for some time. Could I please see you? The old one gave us some flax and said, Why don't you spin this little flax? So Vasilisa started to spin and she made the finest. Most beautiful thread that I've seen on earth. She spun and she spun and she spun. And finally, she said, I've spun this thread. Let me weave something out of this. And she started to weave. And she made the lightest, softest fabric that the old woman had ever seen. She handed over the fabric to the old woman and said, Please sell this in the market, mother. And make some money for yourself. Oh, my dear, this fabric is fed for the summer. She said, the woman set off to the palace. The son was young. As soon as he saw the woman, he got up and bowed to her and said, What can I do for you, mother? 
the lady handed over the fabric to her set. I brought a gift for you, your majesty. The Tsar looked at the fabric. He loved it. Thank you, he said. He ordered his guards to give the old lady some gifts and send her on her way. The old lady went back home. And the Tsar called his tailors and said, stitch some shirts for me with this fabric. The tailors had one look at the fabric and said, your majesty, we cannot touch this fabric. Only the needlewoman, the weaver who made the fabric can make it for you. Oh, I see, said the Tsar. And he sent for the old woman. The old woman came to the palace and the Tsar said, you have created this fabric. You made this fabric, so please stitch the shirts for me. Oh, it wasn't me, your majesty. Then please ask her to stitch the shirts for me, said the Tsar. I shall do that, your majesty. The old lady took the fabric, went back home, and told Vasilisa what the Tsar had asked for. Vasilisa immediately cut the fabric, and she stitched the most magnificent shirts that anybody had ever seen. You must come with me, Vasilisa. Let's put the palace and hand over the shirts to the Tsar. There was two of them and back together to the palace. And of course, they all stories. The moment Vasilisa set his eyes on the Tsar, the Tsar set his eyes on Vasilisa. Their eyes locked and they fell in love. The Tsar got off his talking and he said, Vasilisa, will you marry me? And Vasilisa, of course, said, Yes, please. And they were married. And Vasilisa never forgot her doll, nor did she forget the old woman. The old woman continued to stay in the palace with Vasilisa. And Vasilisa's doll, the doll lived with Vasilisa as long as she lived, the doll was there too. And that's the end of the story. Thank you for this. Okay, thank you very much. So Vasilisa, she wove a very fine uh, cloth. Is that the was that the idea that they she made a shirt out of a very fine cloth? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that seems to represent uh, her good character somehow. <laughs> I suppose. Sure. Well. She has two qualities, one that she can weave a very fine cloth, and the other is that um, because she's good, uh, the fire doesn't harm her. Right? The fire only harms yeah. the, uh, the wicked characters. Correct. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, I, I made this doll myself. I thought maybe I should use this doll in the store. Mm -hmm. This one. With all the waste fabric I had put together, made a face, put hair on it. I thought, okay, this can be a series of stall. Mm -hmm. I love the story simply because I feel that, you know, what Baba Yaga is trying to tell, uh, tell, I mean, tell you over the story, over the story is that blessings are not in our lives. You have to be strong. You have to fight for yourself, especially for a woman. So I feel that is the message I got from the story. That mm -hmm. Baba Yaga is not an evil person. It's evil, yes. But she by herself is not evil. Well, Why should you I, depend on someone to look after you when you can do it yourself? It's what I believe in, at least. Mm -hmm. Well, Baba Yaga is a little gruff, but. Um, but Tough yeah. love. Yeah, but we get the sense that she's really kind to, to good people. Yeah. But she. Um, she, uh, but but with wicked people, she turns their own wickedness against them. Mm. It's a big giveaway. Sorry, Padma, yeah. Hmm? No, no, Padma says that my audio was not clear. I think that's because I'm not sitting, I'm not, I'm sitting in a place that perhaps the Wi-Fi or whatever is not good. I don't know. Yeah. She says, she me. <laughs> No, the and the, the giveaway that Baba Yaga has um special powers, well, that she can make this fire that only harms wicked people, um, but also that these three men come through. One is dressed in red, one in black, one in white, and they represent different times of the day. It um th th these are qualities 
related to a, 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 a goddess. And, and as I've mentioned, many of the fairy tales that came into existence in, in Russia, in Europe, in Scandinavia, uh, came into existence sometime after the worship of Jesus Christ, uh, of Christianity, was implemented. And um, so the stories about local goddesses were, were forbidden, uh, but they were recycled into fairy tales. So, and it's especially with these strong female characters who often live in the forest. They can see the future, they have a magic wand, or in the case like this, they can give fire that only ha harms uh, bad people. Uh, so you can really feel the, um, the mythic under, under the, the, the mythic nature underneath all, all of this for that character. So, you know, I have a question mm -hmm. or even Eric can answer. In the story, uh, the part where the Baba Yaga asks three questions about three horses, what question does she ask? Was this, we lost Renu there. The audio was very poor. What well, did she I ask? think it was okay. Vasilisa who asked the questions, right? The girl. Yeah, right. And uh, then one yeah. question Baba Yaga asks after she asked the three, three questions. What was that? That Baba Yaga asked the girl? Yes. Uh, and how does she, why does she let her go? I mean, because she answered, I we lost Reno there. The voice was, uh, audio was very poor. So I didn't understand why she let the girl go because of the questions or because of the questions she asked. Yeah, it looks like Renu has, has dropped out. So we're not going to get the information from her. Okay. Uh, I, for, I forget what, what question she asks um, Vasilisa. Does anyone remember? I can look it up. I mean, I Okay, have, uh, okay. I can, I can no, look no, it up. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, you I, actually lost her, no? so even I had uh, this question in mind. I thought she just asked about the knights, like what they mean, each of the red, white, and black knights, like what they signify. Yeah, that's, those are the questions that Vasilisa... After that, there was something that we missed. The, the, the Vasilisa asked Baba Yaga about the, 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 the men with the three colors. Uh, but then it seems uh, Baba Yaga asked um, uh, a question of Vasilisa, and that's what we're going to find out. Oh, she asked about sure. how you were able to do all, the, all this housework by yourself. Uh -huh. Like it was like like she she assigned all this housework to her and it was like seemed like it was almost inhuman like for one person to handle and i think she was just wondering how you we were able to do it and what did vasilisa say that that i didn't get <laughs> yeah i was almost didn't get from the audio well often um characters like this uh because they're kind you know in in fairy tales um it's the kindness of of the young uh, hero or heroine that that um, saves her. So maybe earlier in the story she was kind to to some small animals, and then the animals came and, and helped her do the do do the task. Uh, Vicky. Oh, I just wanted to add about Baba Yaga. I love stories about her because. She doesn't seem sympathetic in the beginning, but she's actually the gateway to the consequences of your actions. Mm. And gateways are never easy. And, you know, they're never sweet and simple. And so I, I always like, when I know it's a Baba Yaga story, I love watching where the, how the characters are going to go through that gateway. So. What an interesting phrase. Uh a gateway to the consequences of one's actions. Hmm. That's how I see her. Uh huh. Uh huh. There's a um, a a story in the Grimm collection. Uh, it's usually called Mother Holda, in which um, uh, an, an a senior woman who lives in the forest, uh, uh, a, a kind young girl, young woman, uh, comes to visit her and. Um, and work for her, and then when the when the kind girl leaves, um, beautiful things fall on her. 
uh, either yeah. flowers or pieces of gold. Uh, but then her, her older sister comes and um, her older sister is not nice. And and the older sister does not do work and, and she doesn't behave well. Uh, she's rude. <laughs> and so when the older sister leaves the house, um, uh, bad things fall on her. Um, snakes, lizards, dirt, poop. Yeah. Uh, so uh, again, that senior female character is not just a gateway, but a sort of facilitator of, of uh, characters' um, experience, of, experience of physical manifestation of their own inner nature. And you know, it always involves work. You don't get something for nothing. Yes, yes. Somebody and if you refuse to do the work, Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's an uh, an essay uh, by Theodora Goss, G O S S, the fairy tale heroine's journey. Uh, I'll I'll put a link to it in the in the chat, uh, which says that in in many fairy tales, the um a young woman goes off into the forest and is mentored by a, a senior woman there, and along the way, the young woman um uh works learns a craft and eventually um uh comes to a very good end because uh with that craft she uh you know she does very well but then uh a woman criticized that the other day to me she said why does the fairy tale heroine only do like sewing and cooking that kind of you know domestic domestic work and I thought about that. I thought, okay, that's a valid criticism. But then I realized that's the kind of work women did in those days. <laughs> and uh, I think really what it's about is the um, the young character is willing to, um, you know, uh, put aside her ego. She's willing to uh, apply herself to 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 do something to be helpful uh to create something and and to help others so uh it's not really important what it is but it's it's just something for the for the for the for the common good so if we want to transport it to the uh, you know present day uh she could be you know uh, the, the mayor of a town uh but it would still be learning how to do something uh for for the for the common good Anyone else? Anyone? Any thoughts? Uh, oh, Barry, go ahead. Eric, yeah. Um, just getting back to that uh, that earlier question. Um, as an intrepid storytelling researcher, I have uh, found a page called Wikipedia on <laughs> Vasilisa, and it says that the question um, that in return Baba Yaga inquires as to the cause of Vasilisa's success, and the answer is by my mother's blessing, and that Baba Yaga. Oh yes. Didn't oh, want anyone with any kind of blessing in her presence. So, and I, it got garbled, so I'm not sure if that's what Renner's version had. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Thank uh, you, Betty. Uh, yes. Yeah, so there, um, Baba Yaga is gruff. She doesn't want to hear about blessings, but um, uh, or maybe she's sort of jealous that her that her you know mentee uh, is still so attached to her to her mother. Um, but yeah. Uh, Baba Yaga is not big on sentimentality. But certainly that doll, uh, it you know, it represents the the love and the bond that the that the girl had with her mother, and that um that pulls her through, that helps her. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Deepa. So I've always been fascinated by Baba Yaga uh, because uh, I still remember in uh, maybe early 90s when uh, this India and Russia had this exchange, cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. So those days we often got uh, some Russian magazines in India. And uh, I still remember my mom had bought a couple of uh, 
टू टू बुक्स रशियन फोक टेल्स वन इन हिंदी रूसी लोक कथाएं एंड द सेकेंड वन इन इंग्लिश उटिंग Mm. so th- this was a common terminology used whenever it uh, baba yaga was mentioned somewhere mm. and the witchcraft that she used to do and the kind of house that she used to live in so this story by renu brought back all those memories that were somewhere long lost when i had read those stories and somehow now i have started searching for that book if i could get back those books so yeah that i wanted to share and baba yaga seems to be one of the famous characters in almost all the stories that i had always read from um, russia hmm hmm okay so now lalitha yes sir you're going to tell us a story from indian mythology yes sir go ahead why don't you introduce yourself and uh and tell us about your work and and tell us a story hi hello everybody i am lalita tilak and it's great to be here thank you very much for giving me this opportunity i am from chennai india and i love narrating a variety of stories i primarily work with children but yes i do love narrating indian mythology stories and today i am going to tell you all a story which i have titled from a thief to a sage So let me get right into the story. Ratnakar was a little boy who lived in the forest with his father, who was a sage. Now one day, Ratnakar, the little boy, wandered into the forest and he was playing, and he lost his way. The little boy started crying. He roamed here, there, but he couldn't find the ashram where his father lived, and it became dark. Suddenly, a hunter spotted this little boy crying and asked him. Who are you? I am Ratnakar. I am lost. I have to go to my father. Where is your father's house? I don't know. I don't know. My father lives in Nashram. I am lost. I am lost. And the little boy was crying. The hunter took pity on the little boy and took him to his house. Now days passed by. Everybody in the hunter's house, his parents, his wife, his brothers, they all showered love on Ratnakar. As soon. The little boy forgot about his original house father, and he started living as the little son of the house. The hunter and his family took care of Ratnakar very well, and as Ratnakar grew up, he started learning all the hunting skills from his father. When Ratnakar was a young man, he was the best hunter in the forest, and he used to kill anything, even by listening to the noise of the animal. He used to shoot. and he was one of the most skilled hunter well he got married his wife and his family his children he had many children and soon the family started growing he had a huge family grandparents parents uncles wife children and to take care of the entire family was his responsibility as days passed by ratnakar realized that hunting was not enough to keep his family comfortable and that is when ratnakar decided that he would choose another profession which was of course looting the travelers who traveled through the forest now he turned into a deadly decoy any traveler who used to wander through the forest he used to attack and loot he used to harm the travelers sometimes kill them and loot whatever they have and he started taking care of his family life became very comfortable for his family of course the loots came in every day and they started living comfortably he shared everything with his family they were all so happy and ratnakar was so satisfied yes the family which he loves with his heart they are happy and comfortable one day when ratnakar was waiting in the forest as usual waiting for a traveler to pass by he heard a voice 
oh not a voice but somebody singing shri rati shayana narayana shri lakshmi namana narayana 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 when the person came closer atmakar saw it was a sage a man who was clad in saffron holding a tambura and singing atmakar jumped right in front of the sage and said come on come on whatever you have you have to give me the sage totally at peace he did not even look scared he simply smiled at atmakar he looked so divine he looked so peaceful oh yes it was none other than narada the divine sage who was wandering to the forest and ratnakar immediately said what do you have in that instrument of yours i'm sure it's filled with coins come on give me whatever you have narada just smiled and said my dear son i just have the name of god to give you narayana narayana i am just a wandering sage who spreads the glory of the supreme lord for a moment ratna was all ratnakar was all struck looking at the sage and his complete bliss uttering the name of the lord but still he had to do he had his work to do right he said no now you tell me i'm sure you're somebody disguised as this holy man i'm sure you have something just give it to me once again narada was not at all scared he looked at ratnakar and said my son i have nothing to give you but the name of the lord but yes can i ask you a question why why are you doing all this see it is wrong what you are doing you you cannot harm people you cannot kill them you cannot steal from them mm. what you are doing you are just piling up sins for which you are going to be punished ratnakar heard the sage he just thought and he said no i don't know anything i just love my family i want to keep my family comfortable so i don't mind stealing or killing or looting people narada once again smiled really do you share everything with your family oh yes i love my family my family loves me i share and they share everything with me and i also share everything with them then narada asked a question ratnakar over the years you've looted so many people you become a dreaded dacoit and you have accumulated so many sins for which you're going to get a lot of punishments so you just tell me one thing ratnakar will your family share all the sins and the punishments that you have committed so far and the punishments you're going to get for all the sins you've committed so far well maybe i don't know but i know my family loves me so narada once again smiled and said okay why have this doubt you go you go you go to your family ask them tell them that all these years you've committed so many sins are they going to share your punishment all right all right i'll go and ask them but you 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 sage you're not going to escape from here don't worry my son i am not going to go anywhere i have no agenda i will wait for you over here replied narada still ratnaka did not believe narada he took all the hanging branches he tied up narada to a tree and he said you wait here i will ask my family and come back with the answer so ratnaka went to his home and he announced i am back all the members of the family assembled waiting to see what he's got today what he what they can take from there how they can use it but when they saw ratnaka empty handed they were a bit disappointed and then ratnaka looked at all of them and said well today i met a sage and he said that over the years i've committed a lot of sins and i'm going to get a lot of punishments for that so he wanted me to ask all of you just like how i share all the loot with each one of you will you all share all my punishments family they were shocked to hear this ratnakar first turned and looked towards his father his father gave him a stern look and said ratnakar did i ever ask you to steal to feed me oh no i never knew you would go and steal and come and feed us you have committed the sin why should i share your punishment ratnakar 
was a little disappointed, but he knew his mother really loved him and would do anything. He looked at his mother, and his mother was like, Ratnakar, my son, how can you? I can't believe that you're saying that you're a thief and you steal. And me, me, poor old lady, you want me to share your punishment? How can I bear to take a punishment, Ratnakar? You have to face what you are going to get. And one by one, his uncles and his aunts said the same thing. He looked at his children who were very confused. And his last hope, his loving wife, he looked at her. But his wife too. My dear husband, as it is, I share the burden of taking care of your family here. And you, you want me to take your punishment? Oh no, I cannot share your sins or your punishment. Ratnaka was totally crestfallen. The loving family. And suddenly he felt all alone as though he had no one in this world. He did not know what to do. And that's when he went running back. He went running back to the forest exactly to the same place where he had been sage. And he fell on the sage's feet. And he said, oh sage, oh sage, I feel totally lost. I feel my life has been meaningless till now. What do I do? What do I do? He just poured out his grief to Narada. Narada smiled at Ratnakar and said, Ratnakar, you have to find the true purpose of your life. And you can do that by meditating and chanting the name of the Lord. Now Ratnakar was a hunter and now a decoy who killed people and looted people. How would he know what is meditation, what is Lord's name? Narada once again guided Ratnakar and he said, Ratnakar, Rama is one of the names of Lord Vishnu. Why don't you chant the name of Rama and definitely you will discover the purpose of your life. Ratnakar tried to tell the name of the Lord. Narada realized that a hunter, it's not easy for him to take the name of the Lord. So Narada said, Ratnakar, why don't you try saying Mara? See, Mara in a hunter's language means to kill. So why don't you just say Mara, Mara, Mara continuously? This was easy for Ratnakar. So he said, Mara, 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 Mara. So when you say Mara, 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 it now starts sounding like Rama, 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 right? So Ratnakar sat in one place in a meditative pose. He just completely believed the sage because the sage had enlightened him and he started chanting the name. He started as Mara, 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 but still eventually it started sounding like Rama, 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 Rama. Years passed by. And once again, through the same forest, Sri Rati Sayana Narayana Sri Lakshmi Namana Narayana Narayan Ram Ram Narayan Ram Ram Narada was passing through the same forest and he could hear the voice Ram 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 coming from somewhere. He looked here and there. He could not find anybody. And as he went closer, he saw a ant hill. And when he kept his ears closer to the ant hill, he heard the voice coming from inside the ant hill. Rama, 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 Rama. Arata realized this was none other than the same thief years ago who had started chanting the name of Rama. And now, after so many years, he did not even realize that the ant hill had covered him. Narada broke open the gnat hill and that's when Ratnakar opened his eyes. He was now a totally different person. He looked so much at peace and he really looked divine. Narada blessed Ratnakar and he said, Ratnakar, all these years you've been steadfast in your meditation and devotion. Because of this, you have achieved the status of a Brahma Rishi, the Supreme Rishi. From today onwards, Ratnakar, you are going to be called Valmiki. Why Valmiki? Because in Sanskrit, 
Valmika means now because he came out of an anthill, Valmika, Narada named him Valmiki. He said, Valmiki, you go to the banks of the river Ganga and set up your ashram there. And from today onwards, the world will know you as Rishi Valmiki. As per his guru's instructions, Rishi Valmiki went to the bank of the river Ganga and set up his ashram. One morning, when this Rishi was going towards the river to perform his morning duties, he saw a beautiful <clears throat> pair of cranes. And these two cranes, the male crane and the female crane, they were making love and they were so happy. And it was a very peaceful sight. But suddenly, from somewhere, an arrow struck the male crane and the male crane fell dead. The female crane screeched in grief and she too fell dead beside the partner. This Rishi Valmiki spotted the hunter and cursed him. And this was the curse. Manishad Pratishta Dwam Agamaha Shashwati Samaha Yat Krauncha Mitunade Kam Avadhi now, Valmiki was totally stunned. The curse he gave to the hunter meant, Oh, you hunter, you will always suffer and find no peace because you have killed a being which was a totally peace and it was making love to its partner. Okay, so now Valmiki realized that the curse came out as a worse. It was the very first verse in Sanskrit. And he also realized that it was grammatically, beautifully sequenced in the right manner. That is when Valmiki heard the divine voice. And that was the voice of Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma instructed Valmiki, Valmiki, you are the one who is going to write the Ramayana for the world. Your Ramayana will be the very first Ramayana which the world is ever going to read. And you are blessed. You are blessed with this poetic talent and you are going to render the verses of the Ramayana. Now, Valmiki had heard the story of Rama. Rama is none other than the incarnation of Lord Vishnu from Narada. But now, the story was in his mind. He did not know how to bring about it. But with Brahma's blessings, he realized that he could start writing the Ramayana. He started writing the Ramayana and the very first Rama verse of the Valmiki Ramayana even today is the curse which he let out in Sanskrit. The same curse which he gave to the hunter. Valmiki is very important for us because uh, Valmiki is the Valmiki Ramayana is the very first Ramayana. It's a very first work in Sanskrit, a poetic work in Sanskrit. And it is called the Adi Kavi or the first uh, Adi Kavya or the first poem. And Valmiki is referred to as Adi Kavi, or the very first poet in Sanskrit. Of course, today there are so many versions of Ramayana. But today, even today, after so many hundreds of years, the Valmiki's Ramayana is the most holy book which is revered in our country, India. It has got 24,000 verses, all written by Valmiki. And the very first verse is the curse he gave, which was a poetic curse to the Hunter. So Adi Kavi Valmiki gave us the Adi Kavya Ramayana, the very first work in Sanskrit. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. So it seems, as, as I hear the story, the two essential uh, the elements of the story are when the character starts his violent ways and then when he stops his violent ways. And you told very uh, clearly uh, the circumstances in, in each case. Yes, Eric, this is one of my favorite stories and I've narrated it so many times the children because I feel this story should be known to every generation and the children also enjoy listening to this story and they should know how the Ramayana came about so it's very important especially 
for the generations to know who is Valmiki, how did the Ramayana come? And not only for the mythology part, it's also the part where you know we are, we are all responsible for our own actions. So the way the hunter's family, the moment he says, share my punishment, none of them are ready. So that's when the hunter gets the realization that, you know, what is the purpose of his life or what's the meaning of his life? So I think that that's one of the stories. So I just wanted to share it with the audience here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I'm realizing that pattern appears in many traditional stories of, um, you know, taking up the uh, violent, destructive lifestyle and then and then giving up the violent, destructive lifestyle. Uh, Subu Arumugam, who was a Vilupatu uh, performer, uh, that's a form of um, folk um, storytelling here in Tamil Nadu, he told me uh, the story of how um, Vilupatu came to be. Vilupatu, uh, it, it, uh, it involves a, a storyteller uh, who's talking, and then after he talks for some time, he uh, uh, hits a, a, a stringed instrument that has bells on it, and um, uh, and people sing in his in his storytelling troupe, uh, and the string that has the bells is connected to a bow. So the story that he told me about the beginning of of this art form was that there was a hunter, a, a king, I guess, who was hunting, and then. Um, he, he shot with a bow and arrow a, uh, a deer, who I think turned out to be the mother of some, some little deer. And when the king realized that, he felt very bad. He felt guilty. So he made a vow at that moment to um, no longer use his bow for hunting, but to use it as a musical instrument. And that is the founding story of that, of that art form that uses the... Um, the the bow with the string with the bells. Yes. You've heard that story too? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I've heard it from Lavanya Prasad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a it's a common theme. It's a deep theme. How we go astray and how we uh and how we uh, uh improve ourselves. And you know this is from a particular point of view, which is that hunting, killing animals, is um, a negative thing. That's you know that's not everybody's point of view. It's a particular point of view. This is when Narada says you're harming people, looting them, you're killing people. Ah, so he yeah, was a looting, decoit. looting he and, was a decoit. and uh, he was killing people. Thief. And yeah, he that's... was not a hunter. He had turned into a decoit. So uh -huh, uh -huh. that is when Narada tells. Mm -hmm. Anybody, uh, Nikki, uh, Vicky, go ahead. <laughs> I really love this story. I've never heard it before. And I really enjoyed the ethical levels on so many levels. There's so much to learn from it. And I couldn't help but think of the sage as a Baba Yaga of sorts. And mm -hmm. here he comes, the main character who has something he has to learn. And he comes up against this wall. And I just love it when the sage doesn't tell him, you know, oh, you're a rotten person. Oh, you should feel badly. He just simply asks him to go look in the mirror, go back to his family and say, well, I've given you all this. Will you share with my punishment? And he sees reflected back to him the selfishness that he has been using to feed his family. And I, I it just... It's a really deep and beautiful story and you told it wonderfully. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vicky. Thank you. I'd like to say Lalita, thank you so much for the story. It's fascinating um, to, to learn more about, uh, you know, Indian mythology and the backstory of the uh, Ramayana. And um, I just uh, finished reading a book that uh, Surika Day uh, suggested to me um, called a Living Ramayanas, and it's by uh, a scholar named Aziz Taruvana, and it's it's about kind of Ramayanas throughout India and throughout the you know Asia and the extended world, and also about kind of the roots of the Ramayana in Wayanad and in in you know the the mountains there, 
and um, locating different places. And it's of course much more than that, but um, it's 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 very much you know starting to ground me in understanding and also just learning about Valmiki and um, the, yes. the backstory behind Valmiki, um, which I had no idea of. So thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. And Valmiki's Ramayana is the very first one. So all the other versions are after his Ramayana. So that is no, what the, is the, the Ramayana is actually for, for for people inside the culture. It's considered history. It's considered events that happened. So people yes. who write the story, they are not creative writers. They are historians. <laughs> they uh, his is the first written version of it, right? It's yes, a, this is the first written version, the Sanskrit. The very first written version is Valmiki's Ramayana. There are other versions, other people who have adapted to the different, based on their culture, there are so many Ramayanas in different languages also. But the very first Ramayana is Valmiki's Ramayana. And just to add, um, like Eric said, they are historians, but they are also poets because the entire verse is, is all metered. When you see it's everything will rhyme. You can even sing it. It's everything falls to a meter. Such is the precision with which the entire 24,000 uh, verses. verses were it. It's quite a feat. Yeah, it's a poem. It's a first Sanskrit poem. That's why it's called the Adi Kavya. And yeah. uh, Valmiki is referred to as the Adi uh, Kavi. Kavi is poet and Kavya is a poetic work. So yes. Adi means first. Many grammar, grammar rules of Sanskrit have been adopted from that. Yeah, people have studied Ramayana to understand the grammar and that grammar rules have been adapted for different languages as well to create grammar or for to study for uh, people like us, common people like us. They have simplified those grammar rules for people like us and it all began, began from Valmiki Ramayana. And thank you, Lalita ji. I'm, this is the first time I'm listening to you. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I did not know that the first verse of Ramayana was actually the curse. So, yes. yeah, thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Deepa. Thank you so much. And I have another question. And that is, um, I found it fascinating and really love that twist of the Mara to the Rama. Um, and... I assume that's in Sanskrit, but has that has that carried forward into modern Indian languages? That you know that the Mara uh, word. The Mara. Mara word is a Sanskrit word. The Mara is a Sanskrit word, which means to kill. Right. So, but in, to... has that has that parallel of Mara and Rama carried forward into modern into you know Tamil or or Malayalam or or Hindi Hindi. Uh, Hindi. Um, you are asking whether it's been carried for the other versions? Yeah. Uh, it I'm remains the aware. same, I think. I think it remains the same as per my information of uh, listening to the same story in different versions, different languages. Rama is a word when you reverse it, like pronounce it Ra. in the opposite way, Mara. So it is something Mara. like what we call it as, um, what are these uh, words? Na? Uh, I'll just let you know so this is always the opposite so for teaching the kids or individuals who are atheists who don't know what believe in ram so they always say okay mara 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 so they always it is a way okay you don't believe in it no problem you say the opposite but you will be eventually pronouncing the name which is eventually going to bring you a lot of wisdom and as a result it will uh, bring you good luck so the rama or the ram Ram is the uh, word, common word used in all the languages. And Mara in Hindi means to hit. And Mara comes even in the many other Indian languages. The word Mara is there in many Indian languages. Mara. Yes. Mara so, is uh, dead. Mara is dead. And Mara. Mara is to hit. Not necessarily hit. kill. Mara is to hit. Kill. hit. Mara is yeah. dead. So in Hindi, it is actually Ram. The original is Ram. But when we pronounce it in English, somehow uh, due to the, I don't know what influence, the British influence or what, it has been changed to Rama in English. Originally, it is Ram. 
No, but in Sanskrit, it is Rama. It is Rama it's only. Rama only. It's Rama it's only. Okay. It's Rama only. The original is Rama. Oh, okay. Rama's name is Rama. Is Rama. There is no. There is oh, no. Yeah, it's Hindi only. Okay. There's no. It's Rama. Yeah, yeah. There is no Kalant uh, uh, after Ma. So it is it yeah. has to be pronounced full. It is Rama. Okay, that is the correct pronunciation in Hindi as okay. well as Sanskrit. Barry, word. to answer your question, Barry, many of the languages, Tamil, Telugu and all, they have their Rama. roots in Sanskrit. So the words are related. So they have their roots in Sanskrit. Like Bhojanam, Bhojan. Like, you know, the words are related. So as you say, it comes across languages. So that's... When we were growing up, just wanted to add. So when we were growing up, Instead of saying Mara or uh, Mara, this we used to say it as Mara. So Mara in Kannada means tree. Ah, so instead of Mara, kill, they would say just keep repeating Mara Mara. So we would say Mara 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 Mara, mara and it would become Rama. And uh, so from tree it became Rama for us when we were kids. So that's what in different dialects it's the word which has a meaning like where like somewhere to kill somewhere is a tree somewhere but mara word exists in different dialects yeah. very good all right uh shall we proceed to the next th storyteller okay beverly in new york state you are going to um well please uh, introduce yourself and uh Tell us about your work and, and tell us about the story that you're going to tell today. Tell us the title and please tell us the story. Oh, you got to turn your mic on, your microphone on. Good morning. My name is Beverly Schwartz. I'm from the Albany, New York area. And I was a third grade teacher for 35 and a half years. And um, I used to tell a lot of the make-believe storytelling, um, you know, things that kids just love to hear. But I also now do um, personal stories. And this story is um, about something that happened to my grandparents and their family, which still affects me today. Okay. The name of the story is, there's always room for one more. It was 1914 in Eastern Europe. And the army started going into all the, their villages. And they would come in the village and say, Jews, get out of our country or we will kill you. We don't want Jews living in our country. And scared and yet brave at the same time, these Jewish villagers took whatever they could carry and walked to the nearest ports on the coast of Eastern Europe. And they would get on boats and they went all over the world and immigrated to different places, not knowing what was going to happen and who would they know maybe from their country or be totally alone. My grandparents, my grandmother lived in Poland. My grandfather lived in Russia. And they both made it on the boats to Ellis Island. Now, when they got to Ellis Island, which is a little island outside of the harbor of New York City, they were taken in, like all immigrants were in those days, and they were checked to make sure they had no contagious diseases or had health problems that they could see doctors for before going into America because they did not want anybody to catch anything. And they also vetted them to make sure they weren't going to be dangerous people when they came to into the city. And when they were on the boat, people told both of my grandparents, when you get there, tell them that you're a seamstress and you're a tailor so that the Hebrew Tailor Association in New York City would come and get you and start your new life with them. Now, my grandfather was the tailor. My grandmother was the seamstress. So they were met by this organization and taken in and given clothes and fed and maybe to a doctor if they needed medical help. And for a week or so, they stayed in New York City. And then they said, Do you, where are your relatives located from either New Jersey or Montreal? That's where these organizations existed. And they said, we, they both said, Albany, New York. So they were given a free train ride and met by their relatives and friends and from their villages. 
and they were taken in as immigrants and given again clothes and a, maybe their own apartment and and they were supported and they my grandparents did meet and fell in love and married and they saved every penny to open up their own tailor shop and they called it Meyer Shearer's Tailors and they were such proud people and above it, you would walk down into a basement and they, it was all glass in front so everyone could see into the shop. And on top, my grandma and grandpa had three kids, my mother, my aunt, and my uncle. And they loved that shop. And my mother grew up and got married and my grandmother decided it was time to get a two family house in upstate, you know, up in the Albany area. And uh, my mother, when she was married, moved with my father and lived above them. And then I was born. And then the, my story starts. My mother would drop me off at the tailor shop to do errands almost every day. So growing up as a child, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. Now, every time my grandfather pressed something, the smell of steam filled the shop. It was a distinct smell. And the oil had to be put on the foot pedal of my grandmother's sewing machine as it went up and down as she sewed and made like a, a little song out of the squeaks. And I would sit and watch people coming in and out all day long. Some of them dressed really funny. And I say, Grandma and Grandpa, what are these funny clothes that these people are wearing? Oh, well, they're from different countries, and that's the type of clothes they wear in their countries. They just got here to America, and they're new, and they still are wearing their clothes that they came with. Oh, and they were from India and China and Japan, all over. It was like a fashion show every day. And I say, Grandma, Grandpa, you have two signs. I can't read. What do they say? Well, one said, sorry, no trust. What does that mean? Well, people come and they say, can I take my clothes back and pay you later? And my grandmother would say, you're a machinic and a, a crazy person. You don't do that. You'll never get your money back. They're never going to come back. We're going to keep them if they don't come back. Oh, I understand. And I said, well, what's the other sign say? Not responsible for clothes left after 30 days. Well, what does that mean, Grandma? Well, if they don't pick them up, we put them in the back of our store. And we tell all of our customers, spread the word. We have clothes to give to new immigrants in the country. Have them come here to pick out the clothes that they need. Oh, is that why a lot of people in those funny clothes come? Yes, Beverly, that's why. So I noticed these people coming in, and my grand they'd come over very shyly, maybe to my grandmother or grandfather, and say, we, in a very low voice, because I think they were proud. Do you have any free clothes? I hear you do. And they would say, oh, yes, welcome to America. And they'd hug them, come. And they'd follow them to the back part of the, store which had a curtain so it was very private and they would go in and try on clothes and come out with big smiles carrying their clothes on hangers and they were always carrying a brown bag and with it had food in it why was my grandmother giving them that and again i said grandma why do you always give them a bag of food especially from your garden that you pick every day well they also are new immigrants that need food they, besides clothes. They need help. When we got to America, people took us in and helped us. And this is our way of giving back. <gasps> ah, and then we would sit around the pot belly stove and I would sit on different laps and people would tell me little stories from their country. It was like a show and tell event with their, especially they always brought in goodies from their country to taste. Well, that was an education, but I got another education too, because Friday night we had Shabbos dinner. And I'd always, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, we were all there around a huge table. And the doorbell would ring and some of these people with those funny clothes would also be coming. And I go, 
well, why are you inviting those people to our house? Well, they need to learn English and they have to practice it. They can practice it around our table. They need new friends. They don't have a lot of friends here in our country. So we invite them to make new friends. And we were always squished of sardines. And I said, well, why are we so squished that you know we're like sardines in a can? And she said, Beverly, this is our family tradition is welcoming in immigrants. There's always room for one more around our table. Well, when I was five, my parents decided to move to the suburbs and they both had to work. In those days, even mothers, a lot of mothers did not work, but my mother had to work to make sure we had enough food on our table. And every Sunday was the only day that they never worked, but that we had a family dinner. And we, I'd be getting ready and I'd say to my mother, how many are we having this week? Why? Because my mother was working and if she met any immigrants that just had come to America and were learning English and were settling in, then she'd invite them to dinner. I said, but mom, you know, why are you doing this? We barely have enough food. We have no leftovers. You only buy one portion for everyone at any meal. Well, Beverly, grandma did this. And we are doing a family tradition of inviting immigrants in to make new friends, to practice English, and to welcome them as immigrants to America. It's tradition. Well, a few years ago, it was Christmas Day. And most of the time I would get invited to other people who celebrated Christmas, but that year no one exed me. So I decided I would have a Christmas dinner though I was Jewish. And I called up all my friends and I said, come over, a, bring something for dinner and we'll all enjoy the day. I thought I'd have maybe six or seven people. I ended up with 17 people at my house. We had to T-pone my dining room table just to fit them all in. We were squished like sardines. I felt like I was back at my grandmother's house with everyone talking different languages and bringing different desserts and sharing and telling about the country and why they came to America. And at dessert time, somebody, you know, took a spoon and rang the, the glass to that, like, ding, 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 ding. And we all stopped and looked. And they said, Beverly, I wanted to make sure you knew how grateful and thankful we were to be invited to this dinner. I'm surprised that you did such a big dinner for half of most of us are strangers that you never met. Well, I said, I did this because it's family tradition. My grandmother did this, my mother did this, and I'm following our family tradition of welcoming people, new immigrants who might be scared, not knowing what their future brings not knowing what is going to happen to them in this new land. And we welcome all of you, and we are all immigrants around the table. All of us started with some type of relative coming to America. So I say to you, welcome and thank you to my dinner. This is our family tradition, and I hope someday you will start your own traditions similar to this and welcome new people into America. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful family tradition. And I think it's a good tradition, even not just for immigrants, just to invite people in general, invite people you know. Anybody, any other thoughts? Vicki? Oh, you got to turn your mic on you. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've always got comments to squawk about, but I love this story. I've heard it before, but everybody should keep hearing it because I think with climate change and uh, the world the way it is, immigration is a fact of life. And I think we really need to remind ourselves that 
there's always a place at the table. There has to be. And I just love that message. And I hope you keep telling it and keep telling it and keep telling it. So thank you. You're welcome. Hmm. Mara? You got to the mic on, yeah. The earphones. Yeah, I've uh, I've uh, heard the story too before. I've even seen it with these old images, which stuck in my mind, which were beautiful from the times of the the immigration. And what I uh, it's it's always exciting to watch it develop and change over the. With, over time, yes. what I particularly uh, like was that pers <laughs> perspective of the child who sees all these uh, unusual clothes and doesn't quite understand. So this question and answer was a very nice way of uh, putting uh, that, this into the story, not, not just telling us, yeah, they invited everybody around, but uh, also to show how it formed you you as a child so uh, that you would uh, these this the wish came to to uh, to do to give and I so what I know about you it's this uh, giving tradition is is very strong and lives to this day yeah thank you for the story I think uh, this the concept of humanity is universal, irrespective of the borders and the boundaries and this giving up, giving away or uh, letting people in, inviting them as guests. It's so wonderful. The whole feeling, uh, actually, I was like those two signs that you talked about, they were so profound uh, with the grandmother. They were so insightful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the story. Thank you. Of course, uh, the USA is, uh, well, as you say, due to, um, uh, climate change and economic factors, uh, there is a lot of migration going on and some people don't uh, don't like it. So it's good to hear a, a positive story about uh, migration and welcoming people. Susan? Yes, I, I would agree. It's just a lovely story in terms of welcoming and, and it's, all, it's universal, as it was said before. You know, usually there's always some type of welcoming story and and Beverly's uh, shared that in terms of her family. It's lovely. Thank you. It, it, it's very um, politically a good story to tell in today's world because we America it does have a crisis of immigration and what to do about it. And I hope that the story can meet the hearts of Americans to realize that we're all immigrants no matter how we got here and if it's legal or illegal, but we're people. This is people's lives. And the story has to be told um, to make sure people maybe change their mind and welcome some of these new immigrants and help them get started to a life that their whole family in the future will have. Mm -hmm. Good. Oops. You know, I, I work at a school now in, in Nagacoil, and um, I'm helping to develop the curriculum for this coming year. And um, I think one uh, one activity that I'm going to try to promote is um, uh, encouraging students to, to think and write about their family traditions, uh, their family histories. Uh, in folklore, we call this doing ethnography which you can do with your own family and, and other communities too. 
So I think it's uh, I think it's good for people to uh, become more aware of um, of their of their cultures and their communities. That can sometimes involve interviewing family members. I remember my own grandfather, the only grandparent I knew, my father's father passed away many years ago. Um, uh, I, I wanted to record him telling about his youth in Russia. You know, he he came from Russia to New York, um, but he didn't want to be recorded. He thought I was sort of mocking him, I think. But he he did allow me to listen and ask questions, and I wrote it down. I'm not sure where it is. Um, if you like, at the Albany Institute of History and Art, mm -hmm. I story has evolved in the story you will hear there, but I have a slideshow that takes less than a minute. Mm. It shows the inside of my grandfather's store with the signs and the steaming machine and the sewing machine and the potbelly stove. Mm. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's um, to the music tradition. Sure. And so if you want to just see a short one minute video, you know, go, I'll put it in the um, oh, thank chat. You. Yes. Okay. Albany Institute of History and Art, and uh, I get more. They more people really like the slideshow. Sometimes I think more than the story because it just tells the story and shows that where they came from Europe, and he, it he proudly displayed. I forgot in the story, his um becoming an American citizen. They gave you a certificate, and he had that. They both had theirs hung as soon as you opened the door. That's where they were. They were so proud that they had become American citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that it's all in the slideshow. Okay. Um, I'll yeah, do please, this do, please do post the link. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, so, Eric, oh, can I yeah, just add in a? I just ahead. want to add yes, into what you said to amplify amplify what you said. Having students, you know, do that kind of oral history and talking to their elders, and mm -hmm. uh, it can be wonderful to help them recognize what in them by retelling those stories they recognize how they have come to be who they are, how we have come to be who we are through the experiences that we had when we were younger and um, or through the experiences that, that we've uh, uh, inherited from our parents and our grandparents. So mm -hmm. it's a wonderful um, exercise and reflection and self-identification too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In India, yeah. a complication with doing that kind of work is that um, naturally people will mention what caste they're in. And that's a very delicate subject here. And there's kind of an unwritten rule that you don't really discuss caste in in school and in public because, um, you know, there's the idea that one caste is better than the other or one class is clean and another is unclean. One is pure, one is impure. Uh, so there, you know, some kind of little hard feelings sometimes between the different castes. And so the whole subject is sort of off the table, uh, but um, but I'm hoping we can do it in such a way that uh, you know nobody gets uh, offended and uh, we just deal with the facts of life, of who you know who we are. Susan, yeah, I was just going to say usually uh, there is some welcoming. You know, um, well, I have family on both sides and uh, all immigrants. And there was always this, you know, people living in a house, you know, you know, three, four families living in a house and and then branching off from there and all of those types of of kind of welcoming ways of welcoming mm -hmm. and being part of and including, you know. So it's 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 a huge uh, and people and don't tell those stories as much these days, but they're there because they they happened, you know. With my husband's family uh, over the war from the camps and all that, they were just like, his place was in and out of families back and forth, you know. Um, they're all settled now, but in the beginning, there was a lot of help available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Barry? Uh, I would say um, a corollary to what you said, Eric, about caste uh, in India uh, might be, especially where I live in the southern part of the United States, the, the history of en enslavement. And that as mm. people talk about their family histories, then they have to get into the uncomfortable part of were my ancestors slaveholders? And how do I, you know, mm -hmm. that gets into all the 
all the rigmarole about um, the Southern traditions and uh, the proud sons of the Confederacy and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it can be it can be rough, but you know if we take these questions gingerly and kind of approach them, you know, with humility and with honesty, and realize that what our ancestors did is not necessarily what we do. Uh, maybe there maybe well, the stories. Well, uh, you know, as I'm trained in folklore, I see different castes as you know, you know, collections of treasures of traditional ways of 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 doing things. So I don't focus on the relationships between the castes, but um, but that is there, and uh, there's a lot of, as I say, often unspoken um, thoughts about that. But I, I I like to focus on okay, so what is your what is your community all about? What do you do? Vicky, I'm glad you're back. You disappeared for a moment. Um, there's an expression um, when you know our, all countries are experiencing immigrants at some part of their country's you know history. And, and we do have a lot of people coming into our country and they're going to make our country better and greater if because they have so much to give people to, of their jobs, their personality, their education, their traditions. So it's an expression, make America great again. Welcome the immigrants coming in. Uh -huh. And even that person who says make America <laughs> great again, his family is not, is, you know, Including a, couple of, including a couple of his wives. They, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> they are I, immigrants. You can turn it around and say, hey, make America great again. Welcome immigrants. Yes, and I think yes. that, that's kind of funny at the same time, but and ironic, you know? Yes, yes. Well, it turned out we could not go through this storytelling session without mentioning the... Uh, the I never mentioned it. The, well, no, I well a little bit. Anyway, we're, uh, we're all hoping, we're hoping for the best. Uh, right, uh, Vicky, please, please introduce yourself. And there's there's 18 people in this session. Only six of us have our cameras on, but that's okay. Um, but um, uh, go go ahead, Vicky. Please introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Vicky Ness. I live in California and I have told stories for about 35 years and created radio programs on storytelling. And I have taught, I teach workshops on how to create your own story. And that's what I do. I tell my own stories. This is a story about a hobgoblin. Now a hobgoblin is basically the same thing as a goblin. It's just a different name for it. So this particular hobgoblin was very, very happy because you see he had a dream. Now a hobgoblin without a dream is an extremely unhappy creature. They always have to have a dream to live with and buy. And so his dream came from his stomach. They frequently did. Berries for breakfast, for example. A fish for lunch, for example. This time it was mushrooms for dinner. And so he followed the dream of his stomach and went into the deep dark forest on the side of the mountains to forage for mushrooms. Now at the top of the mountain, behind a veil of fog and rain, was a dragon who terrorized, terrorized the kingdom. But he was bored, you see, he was bored with this kingdom and so, very quietly, he lifted up his wings and with a flap, flap, flap of his huge leathery wings, he took up over, over the sun and over the mountain ranges and disappeared looking for another kingdom to terrorize. Well, when the hobgoblin came down off the mountain with his mushrooms, the peasants saw him and they said, well, the, the dragon is gone, you did it, you're a hero. Hobgoblin is a hero. And Hobgoblin said, no, I am, no, whoa, whoa. Well, the peasants told the nobleman and the nobleman told the king and the king made good his promise that whoever got rid of the dragon, by gosh, could marry the princess, his daughter. Well, the Hobgoblin's dreams went from his stomach to his brain and his head just exploded like, like Roman candles and fireworks of all the wonderful things that he was going to experience because he, a hobgoblin, was going to marry a princess. And so down the long wide road he went 
to the castle, singing to himself about, I'm going to marry a princess. Oh, I'm going to have a crown. I'm going to have a crown. He was so happy. Well, on his way, he came to a place where boulders had fallen down. And he had to, as many people did, pick his way around the boulders to keep going to the castle. And as he was picking his way, an enormous she-bear came galloping down and stood in front of him with a hungry look on her face, her huge paws spread out. You see, it was autumn and bears like to eat a lot in autumn because they sleep through the winter. And he looked like a perfectly lovely dinner. She said to him, oh, no, said the hobgoblin. And she stuck her nose right in his face. And then she began to snuffle. And she looked at him and looked at him. And the longer she looked at him, oh, oh, the kinder her eyes grew. And that's when Hobgoblin realized that the bear was falling in love with him. Hmm. Oh, he thought, I'm, I'm better than a bear. I'm going to marry a princess. Oh, even though his heart was warming to this adorable bear, his mind said, no, a princess. And so he told her that he had to go to the castle to tell the princess he wouldn't marry her. And then he would come back mm -hmm. and, and he would call out to the bear. Now, it would take a while. Why, well, maybe winter would be in the air and frost on the ground. But he would return and he would call out, bear, bear. And if she answered, why, they'd get married. <laughs> oh, the bear was so happy, she galloped back to her cave and threw herself down and waited for her beloved to come back. Oh. Hmm. Well, the hobgoblin whew, escaped that and went on down the road. Now, you see, he didn't like to think of himself as dishonest, but he had plans up here. And so he thought, well, I, I, I will marry the princess and then I'll come back when it's deep winter and I'll call out bear, bear. And if she doesn't answer, which of course she won't because she'll be hibernating, I'll be free, but I will have done what I promised to do. And all the way down the road, he went singing his song again. Oh, she's going to be pretty. She's going to be beautiful. You know what beautiful princesses do? Oh, they make breakfast in bed for their husbands. Oh, oh, oh. oh my goodness. I'm going to be so happy. I'm going to be a hobgoblin prince. And all the way to the long, wide road, he went to the dark castle, an enormous structure that opened up its huge doors like the gaping maw of a predator. Oh. Boy, oh boy, I'm gonna marry a princess. And in he walked, and he was surrounded by an entourage sent by the princess. Kind of clean him up a little bit, whoever was coming to marry her. And they surrounded him and they talked to him in the rhyming language of the court. I said, Oh, this is just great. Oh, the princess has a hobgoblin for a mate. <laughs> and the knight stepped forward and said, Oh, you're disgusting, and you smell, ew, pew. But a deal's a deal, so I guess you'll do. And they whisked him away, and they washed and scrubbed him within an inch of his life, and they stuffed him into satins and silks and pinched up his waist and stuffed his feet into tiny little shoes. And over the coming weeks, they taught him how to hold a teacup. No, oh, and how to stand up and hold a sword and, and how to talk mindlessly over meals and, and how to be quiet when he needed to be. And all the lessons went on, oh, for weeks and weeks until finally they figured they couldn't do any more for him. And they pushed him out of his chamber and directed him down a long, dark corridor. Oh, he was an unhappy hell goblin because, you see, he was stuffed into these clothes and he couldn't remember half of the things that they taught him. And so down on his little stumpy legs, he trundled down the hall with tall, guttering torches throwing shadows behind him and shadows in front of him, the walls dripping with condensation and darkness pooling around his feet. Oh, I'm going to marry a princess, his mind kept telling him. I, I'm going to marry a princess. 
yes, I am. And he went down all the way to the end of the hall. There was a light coming from a room. It was her chamber and it was beautiful. There was a, a fire in the fireplace that caused the candelabras and the chandeliers to twinkle with their crystals and there was satins and silks. And there on a bench was the princess and she was indeed beautiful. She had yellow hair that looked like sun rising behind her. Oh, she was just gorgeous and she sat with the sweetest smile on her face and she patted the bench next to him and invited him to sit down. Oh, she is beautiful. I'm going, I'm going to marry a princess. And he sat down next to her and he was just about to tell her what he'd like for breakfast the next day when she took his hand and told him in the rhyming language of the court what her dreams were in her mind. Well, she looked at him and she said, oh, for God's sake, you're a hobgoblin. I expected at least a man. Ah, oh, but you'll do. I, I just need a husband. It's all just for show. Well, I'll get what I want, even with you in tow. Yes, uh, oh yes, I'm going to off mummy daddy and, and take over the throne. Oh yes, all oh, this and more will be mine to own. Ah, mm, and those stupid noblemen who get in the way, I'll slice them and dice them. Uh, they won't last but a day. Oh, the bones they will break and the blood it will run. I can't wait to get started. Oh, it'll be such fun. Oh, and then we'll oppress all the peasants. Uh, oh, yes. And then when we're done, I, oh, go. Oh. Of course, I will remember. Yes, I will remember to bear you a son. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will. And 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 he will be handsome and and strong and oh, he'll be taller than you by a head. Oh, but this won't matter to you. <laughs> by then, you'll be dead. Oh yes, my placeholder hubby. Yes, I can start my grand coup. Mm. I guess what I'm saying is, ugh, you're disgusting, but you'll do. Hmm. And then she sunk deeper and deeper into the horrific dreams of her mind until she was foaming and shaking and, and screaming gibberish like, like, like a rabid dog on a short chain. No, said the hobgoblin, no, no, what have I done, oh no. And he slipped out of her chamber down the long hall. He stumped back to his chamber and he took off all his nobleman clothes and ran out the back door. And before he knew it, running on his stumpy little legs, he was on the road away from the castle, running as hard as he could, terrified that they would come and drag him back to the castle of his dreams. Well, by now it was November and winter was in the air and frost was on the ground and an enormous indifferent full moon cast a silver shadow on all of the fields around him. Oh, he ran as fast as he could until he got to the place of boulders. He stopped and he shivered in fear as much as in cold. Oh, I miserable, miserable hobgoblin, because you see all the dreams of his mind that that threw themselves up into the night sky like fireworks, uh, uh, they had all fallen like ashes. And so he searched inside himself for a dream and, and he went to his stomach, but his stomach had been very well fed and had no dreams whatsoever. Hmm. Oh, a hobgoblin without a dream is a very miserable creature. And he searched all over himself for a dream. And, and then suddenly his heart spoke up and his heart said that it merely wanted to love and be loved. That was its dream. And, and by the way, that bear was rather sweet looking. Oh, oh, she was. She was a very sweet bear. And so he stood there in the place of the, of the boulders and he called out, bear, bear, will you marry me, bear? But true to his cynical 
expectation, she was deep in sleep. And coming from the mouth of the cave, deep and regular as a foghorn, was bear snoring. <laughs> oh, poor hobgoblin. Oh, now even the dreams of his heart were not going to come true. And he just called out as loud as he could, please bear, will you marry me? And he crawled up over the ice slick boulders to the mouth of her cave. And she woke up a little bit and said, <laughs> which he took to mean, yes, dear, I will marry you. And his heart exploded with joy and he crawled in, not a beautiful stately castle, but a humble little cave that was homey and warm and he threw himself against her belly and she put a sleepy paw over him. And oh, Hobgoblin drifted off into the dark, deep winter night with wonderful dreams warmed by the paw of his beloved and warmed on the inside by the dreams of his heart. And he could be here to say as he fell asleep, oh, Boy, I'm going to marry a bear. Oh, boy. And that's my story. A round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Hmm. You can tell I was a third grade teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was marvelous. I, I absolutely loved it. That was a story I hadn't heard before. You know? Oh, I didn't know that. Thank you. No, I hadn't heard that. But the, mo the what I really get from you is how to be on Zoom and use your body language and your hands above your you know shoulders that makes such a difference in when you were telling your stories. And then you also have the facial expression, but you use your eyes also a lot. To, you know, you're, you know, and everything blends together to put the cherry on the icing to be an A plus story. Oh, thank you. I was asked to write to, I don't write my stories. I just tell them. And, but anyway, I was asked to tell a fairy tale and I don't normally tell fairy tales. And so oh, I, know. I yeah. needed this with that purpose. So. Yeah. Well, with Susan's help, I've, I've, I've done a few story tales and stuff like that. And she's taught me a lot also. So she's my other mentor that um, has really evolved me, you know? So thank you, Susan, also. Well, one, oh, Mara, go ahead. Oh, you got to turn your mic. I wish I could uh, write faster because then I would write down all these wikiisms, which yeah. are so fantastic and which alone would make your story uh, 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 worthwhile uh, listening. What is his dream went from his stomach to his brain. That, that alone was lovely. They taught him how to talk mindlessly over meals. Well, this is something you really have to study. Yeah. you're disgusting but you will do it it's just you know i love your sense of humor and there are all this these unexpected things and the way you tell it with as beverly already said with all your your mimics it's so real you know i see the bear in front of me and it's uh, uh, it's uh, going to be one of my favorite love stories i remember barry telling years ago another story of an absolutely unfitting couple so big and small which i also loved a lot so thanks for this one oh also for your legacy you really should write some of this stuff down because future yeah. storytellers will read it and just like you said is the some of your comments are like for the history books of how to tell um, an interesting story and make it come alive so you really really i urge you to write down your stories and yeah. even, you know, to publish it to our storytellers so we hear all these great mm -hmm. expressions that you use and Definitely. we can them if you have similar ones 
Thank you. I'm learning how, mm -hmm. and I think every storyteller can use this. Once I learn how to do it, and I will tell you, is how to take the uh, a story on, say, YouTube and turn it into text, written text. There is a way to do this. And I am learning at the moment how to do it. It's a little convoluted, but it's a wonderful thing to do because even if you write your story, you have a tendency to move in a different direction here this time and that time. And if, if you can just capture it the way you told it, it's a different thing from what you wrote. Yeah. Every time I tell it, tell it, I tell it differently because I write things down and like I got the expression, it's just well, everyone was you know doing this. I said, I I like it on um, um uh scared and brave at the same time. That mm -hmm. was brand new in the story. I never, but that I think it kind of put the whole feeling together in two words. Mm -hmm. You know. So you, you know, you you people like all of you inspire me to become better. Well, one meaning that I'm getting out of the story, and please tell me if I'm if I'm on target, um, that it's better to spend time with, with people who enjoy you than to spend time with people who you think will benefit you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to watch where your dreams come from. There are a lot of people who follow the dreams that their mind tells them they need to do, you know, for whatever reason. I've got to become a doctor. I've got to make money. I've got to do. And really, if you follow the dreams of your heart, it probably won't lead you to a bad place. Mm -hmm. It's not a particularly deep story. I mean, it's a hobgoblin and a bear, but what the heck? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, mm. Like, I have to have the thing is like dating. You meet all these guys, but there's going to be that group of one or two or whatever that's going to, as you say, follow your heart and lead you to making some good decisions of who we can just, you know, thank you, but you know, no, thank you. <laughs> and then um, continue dating someone, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we all go through that in our lives, you know, friends. Well, do you like this person to be a friend or would you rather have this other person lead you down to a better friendship? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, Thank you so much, Vicky, for, for getting up in the middle of the night. And Barry, did did I understand you're also on the West Coast? East Coast. I know I'm on the West Coast. I'm in Portland, Oregon. So I got yeah. up at, oh, I didn't know I got that. up at 530. I you're on the East Coast. Yeah. Okay. I, I live in Atlanta, but I'm vacationing in Portland right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so <laughs> that, much for the two of you. Yeah. Good. All right. Shall we say uh, good night and good morning? Uh, for, first, let me stop the recording.